Fire Robin is open to a lot of criticisms, and I want to mention at least a couple of them here in passing. Uh, so, for starters, the, the white noise problem. Um, uh, what exactly are we supposed to do in our laboratories in terms of sort of a practical day-to-day -day, uh, advice with uh, if scientists in general were to start embracing this attitude? Every single scientist, you know, uh, from the, the, the lowliest undergrad to the, 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 the most uh, lauded Nobel laureate is going to start generating new ideas, radical new ideas, total left-field, harebrained notions with the hopes that somehow one of them will stick or one of them will sort of work as a catalyst for other new ideas. You would have people constantly putting forward so many ideas that are untethered to anything that how would you sift through them all? Um, I mean, again, let's go back to creationism again. You know, I think there's a lot of biologists and science educators and, uh, and science journalists who get so sick of having to deal with creationism because it, it, it distracts them from what would otherwise be productive work. They have to spend time trying to educate the public at large that creationism isn't science rather than actually doing more science themselves. Wouldn't the world be a better place if we could just relegate creationism to the dustbin of history and focus on live options, on real sort of uh, 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 ideas that, that are still valuable and worthwhile, and maybe even some of them which are sort of outside the mainstream and critical, uh, but at least have a sort of a veneer of plausibility to them. Again, it, it's the, part of the reason why I think Popper was so interested in the problem of demarcation is precisely because he wanted to sort of be able to wall off certain ideas as pseudoscience and say that scientists don't have to take these ideas seriously. And anyone who's interested in science and scientific thinking doesn't have to take these ideas seriously. Let's just ignore them and focus on the stuff which at least might be science, at least is, is, is a contender for science. That's what, that sort of is the value of a demarcation criteria. Is, is it, is it, it's a it's a functional tool. It, allow, it tells us what we can ignore and what we should pay attention to. And yeah, so think about this from a science education point of view, right? I mean, let's say that we were to take uh, Fire Robin's ideas seriously when it comes to science education. Well, we, should we not just teach Darwin in school? We're going to teach creation myths in school too? I mean, well, then we have to say, of course, which creation myths? Americans obviously usually want the, to, to be taught sort of Christian creation myths in, in their schools, but in other parts of the world, there's a wide variety of other creation myths. There's Islamic creation myths, you know, there's Egyptian creation myths, there's ancient Greek creation myths, right? I mean, like, uh, are, are we going to literally teach every single one of these theories? Are we just going to pick sort of a handful of them? I mean, and, and are we going to do this in a science class, for God's sakes? That, that, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. You can see why it's called the white noise problem, right? It just generates all this information, all this, all this data, all this information perspectives that would be simply impossible to handle in any kind of pragmatic way. And the same sort of problem could swamp every single research lab in the world. There has to be some way of discerning in advance which ideas are worth, worth pursuing and which ideas we can simply disregard. Uh, if there isn't some way to parse these sorts of things, uh, research is never going to get off the ground. So the, the white noise problem is, is an issue that Fire Robin has to deal with. And frankly, it's not entirely clear how he's going to do it. The best advice he seems to give is, well, we should follow the ones that interest us. If creationism doesn't interest you, then fine. Don't pursue it. Uh, pursue what you think is interesting, what you think is inspiring, what you think will be sort of the next Galilean revolution in your field. Uh, but if people at the Discovery Institute find creationism interesting, then you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. Let them do their thing. And if they come up with garbage, as they pretty much always do, then they're just going to keep coming up with garbage. Let them produce their garbage. Who knows? Maybe the next Galileo somehow magically might fall out of the Discovery Institute. Again, probably not likely, but we can't rule that out at the outset. Um, it's only by letting everyone sort of pursue their, their, their wherever their, their scientific muse leads them that we're ever going to get to, to any kind of scientific progress or advancement. Now, it's not hard to turn the white noise problem into a very practical objection here. Let's say, again, we take Fire Robin seriously. And again, for the record, Fire Robin says we should not take him seriously. But for the record, let's run with it, right? Let's try. Let's see what happens. Let's say that we are going to take his approach to science as the way we should do science. There are all sorts of people out there who deny that HIV actually causes AIDS. There are people out there who insist, contrary to all the available evidence, that vaccines cause autism. The, these kinds of ideas are not just bad science. They're not just rationally indefensible. They are 
dangerous. If we entertain these ideas, people are going to die. I mean, if we start playing around with creative theories about sanitation or the fertilization of crops or, 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 or medicine, then, then whole lots of people, you know, really billions of human beings could die. Science isn't just an intellectual endeavor. It's a moral endeavor. It improves the quality of life for human beings and extends life for human beings every single day all over the world. I mean, would, would Fire Robin want his doctor giving him the most creative treatments for a disease that he comes down with? I Probably not. Um, being creative sounds really, really nice when we're talking about pure scientific abstract theory, when we're talking perhaps, you know, about uh, you know, theoretical physics. But when we're talking about things like building bridges or cars or airplanes, that's when creativity suddenly starts to sound a little dangerous. Obviously, there has to be some creativity in there to innovate, to come up with new ideas for building. But we don't want unbridled bridled creativity. We don't want people just doing whatever they want, creating the next bridge out of noodle salad or something like that. Um, science is responsible for far too much human well-being to be to treat it simply like a form of human creativity, to treat it simply like another form of art. Uh, uh, th this uh, comic right here from the from saintgasoline.com sort of summarizes the idea well. Again, this isn't entirely fair to Fire Robin, but it gets the idea home. There is no scientific method. Scientific progress is a sham. Science judges itself and other schemes by its own standards. But a rain dance is just as scientific as meteorology. Doctor, save me. Oh, we will, Professor Fire Robin. But instead of using traditional surgery, we're instead going to ascend a pyramid and sacrifice the heart of the slave to the sun. Say, you look a little pale. Like I say, this is probably taking Fire Robin far more seriously than he intends to. Uh, so, again, recognize here, he, I don't think he can, he's not really wanting to go this far. He's trying to be here be a gadfly to help us recognize that science can lean too far in the, in the creativity stifling direction, and occasionally we need to correct back towards the creativity uh, and innovation inspiring direction and try to find an appropriate balance between those two extremes. Now, for the record, Fire Robin does give direct responses to a lot of these arguments, and in many ways they kind of sort of don't necessarily help him in a lot of ways. So he, su he suggests, for example, regarding the practical problem, he, he wants to point out that, that modern science, science as, as it's existed basically since you know, the, the Enlightenment era Europe, isn't the only field that actually can get results. Folk medicine has been practiced for thousands of years in a variety of different cultures, and obviously there's many things that folk medicine can't do terribly well, but there's lots of stuff that folk medicine gets right. Right. And it doesn't seem like folk medicine can be considered scientific, at least in the modern sense of the word. Um, regarding things like bridges, it's, it's again worth remembering that people have been building bridges for a very, very long time long before modern science. Modern science definitely has extended our capacity to build bridges. We can build bigger ones, longer ones, and so forth. Fire Robin isn't knocking that. But it's, impo it's important not to give science too much credit for human endeavors and human creativity because there's lots of different fields that have made advancements which cannot really be called science in, in, in the strict sense of the word. Regarding medicine, okay, I already made the point about folk medicine, um, but it's also worth, the, the counterpoint's worth noting here too. Scientific medicine has had major mistakes, major problems. One of the most, the ones that's probably most egregious in the 20th century is thalidomide, which was, you know, given to, to pregnant women as a form, way of helping them deal with, uh, uh, you know, basic aches and pains, uh, and, and a non-negligible percentage of women who took it ended up causing severe birth defects in the, 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 the babies that were born. Um, thalidomide passed peer review. It passed the, the, the sort of standards that we have at the FDA and so forth for, for responsible medicine, and it ended up causing a tremendous amount of human suffering. So yes, scientific medicine can indeed be good and wonderful. Again, Fire Robin isn't suggesting that we shouldn't do scientific medicine. It's just worth remembering that scientific medicine isn't flawless. It creates problems too. It creates uh, uh, it cre creates moral issues uh, and and can do real harm to human beings. And we should not forget that. We should not immunize medicine, if you'll pardon the pun, from criticism simply because it is successful in certain areas. Furthermore, it's also worth noting that science often succeeds only because of boosting from non-scientific sources. Uh, as I've mentioned before in this class, chemistry was an offshoot of alchemy. Alchemy is generally considered to be a pseudoscience, but without the pseudoscience of alchemy, chemistry never would have been born. Modern chemistry is born out of this pseudoscience. So there, again, the relationship there between science and pseudoscience is pretty blurry. 
Fire Elbend also notes that optics uh, originally began as a form of art. You know, the, 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 the law, rules about light and so forth and perception uh, were developed early on by artists, by Renaissance artists who were trying to, to, to improve their painting and only from there sort of evolved into a branch of physics. Now, oftentimes the kind of history of science that's told by scientists sort of says that, you know, tries to put sort of science at the forefront here and say, no, it was science that perfected the tools for art. and Artists should be thankful to science. Feyerabend wants to say, no, this is a two-way relationship here. Uh, uh, these sort of non-scientific areas inspire science, give rise to scientific advancements and scientific progress. We should not sort of say that science is, is, is the dog wagging the tail. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes it's the non-scientific things that drive science to be better than itself. Now, I want to close here by saying a little bit about another essay of Fire Robbins called How to Defend Society Against Science. And again, this is another again, provocative essay of his uh, and, in which he proposes in the same way there's a separation of church and state, there should be a separation of science and state. Um, now, again, I want to be clear on what he's sort of saying here. He has no problem with science influencing state affairs. He's not saying there should, there should be sort of an impenetrable wall. Obviously, uh, legislatures and so forth are, should be interested in what science has to say. They should have uh, scientific experts. But that's no different than religion. Again, r r religious people have a right to, to, you know, to, to, to preach about things like abortion and so forth. Uh, they have a right to, to, to make sure that their voice is heard and that the legislators, legislators consider uh, religious perspectives. So, uh, uh, what he's suggesting is that that, that sort of the, the role of religion and the role of science here should be more or less on similar footings here in that it's it should be seen as sort of one perspective one kind of thing that people value but it's not the end all be all of what people value science should not be given a place of ultimate authority in society uh it's important obviously but so is religion he thinks uh, um and if, if if as i imagine at least some of you were thinking here uh that that that, that the equivalence here between religion and science is a false false one, uh, and, that, and that science does deserve a place of authority, I think uh, I want you to recognize that there's something sort of fundamentally anti-democratic about that sentiment. Feyerabend here is very much championing democracy, and he says that, look, an open society, something that's generally ruled by the democratic will of the people, can't be ruled by the will of science. Religion might not make sense to you. You might think religion is silly, but ma religion matters to a lot of people, and their will should count in determining what society is going to look like just as much as the will of scientifically literate and informed people. Now, if people choose to embrace science because they find it to be useful, they find it rewarding, they find it, it, it improves their quality of life, or it gives us them a sense of mystery and, and awe and beauty in the world, that's great, Fire Robin says. By all means, go nuts. Science can be all of those things, and it can be wonderful. But if a religious person wants to reject science, or if just a superstitious person wants to reject science, then the science should not be given some sort of authority over their will. They should not have scientific perspectives forced on them simply because they don't share this dominant school of thought that everyone else has. Th that, there is a recipe, therefore, for scientific tyranny, where, where uh, citizens who don't agree with the scientific consensus, who don't agree with the scientific majority, end up being marginalized. And that's a fundamentally anti-democratic attitude that Feyerabend is seriously concerned with. It's not hard to imagine a dystopia in which science becomes sort of the dominant controlling force. Now, it's not hard to sort of see how this can play out. Science oftentimes uses vernacular, which is very, very difficult for publicly minded people to understand. Uh, there are, of course, science educators like Carl Sagan who go out of their way to try to communicate scientific insights to the public. But more often than not, scientific insights are the kinds of things which you really do need a specialized education to, uh, to understand. A society that prioritizes science over democracy, that says that the, the sort of the, the scientific facts, scientific values, scientific perspectives matter more than the perspectives of the everyday person, is going to be one which is going to seriously empower certain groups, a minority group, over the majority. Um, People obviously need to make informed decisions in a democracy, and again, science can play a part in helping inform people. But at the same time, it's difficult for science to do that when it's so often very, very obscure. Now, again, you can say this is because reality is difficult, not because scientists go out of their way to make it look hard. But at the same time, 
you know, if, if scientists really do want to be taken more seriously, if they want to have more power in a democracy, they should do so by appealing to the democratic will of people, by going out of their way to educate people and enlighten people, to show them the facts and to help them understand things, rather than by making this appeal to authority. Science says you're wrong. You have to do what scientists say. You have to believe what scientists believe. That's the attitude that Fire Robin thinks is very, very dangerous. At the end of the day, science is interested, like any other social phenomena, in its own perpetuation, in continuing to get funding for science and continuing to get people interested in science. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but it might be the case that that can actually come at the expense of the well-being of people at large. Uh, it might be the case that you know spending money on a space program, for example, might not be the best, most responsible use of of, of uh, resources for increasing human happiness here on the planet. Now, again, it's, it's it's easy, I think, to tell stories that can connect how spending money on a space program can, in fact, redound to to human well-being. I'm not meaning to challenge those stories here. I simply use that as an example. It's not clear that a society that's oriented fundamentally around science is going to be spending its resources in a way that necessarily increase human well-being. It might do that, but it also might be spending a lot of money on theoretical dead ends, which are uh, not necessarily going to be good for people. So again, I think it's worth remembering Fire Robin here is, is probably exaggerating. I don't think he literally means we need to defend society against science. But I do think he need, says that we need to defend society against a certain attitude about science and recognize that finding a, a relate, or the balance between the democratic will of the people and scientifically informed society is a difficult thing. And we should not simply charge ahead and say, science is the end all be all, it tells us the truth, and we should do whatever it says is right. That is a dangerous attitude that Feyerabend wants to check against.